Bonjour and welcome back to the history of the United States since 1877. Over the past few lectures, we've explored various political movements of the Gilded Age and the Progressive Era, specifically the Socialists and the Communists and the Trade Union Movement, as well as the Conservative Movement that was dominant in the 1870s and 80s, and as well as the Populist Movement that was a big thing in the 1880s and 90s, specifically with the 1896 election and William Jennings Bryan. Today we will move forward to another movement, the Progressive Movement, who essentially would be the ancestors of today's Liberals, the modern-day version of the Democratic Party. They were quite dominant a tiny bit later, 1900s and 1910s, corresponding roughly to the presidencies of Teddy Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson. They are not quite as rural as the populists were. Instead of being located in the Great Plains or the South, the Progressives would be mostly located in the big cities of the Northeast. You'll find them everywhere else as well, but when you think progressive, usually you think of a reformer in New York City or Boston. They are not farmers, typically. They would be more urban professionals, lawyers, teachers, and the like. They are quite an amorphous movement in the sense that they are spanning the Republican and the Democratic parties, usually began at the state level, often associated with Republican causes, and then they kind of gravitate to the Democratic Party when Wilson becomes president, and they are quite successful at the upper level, at the federal level. By comparison with the populists, the movement that we studied last time, that were quite loud but not successful nationally, the progressives were very, very successful. In fact, they passed many of the laws that are still shaping the American political and economic system today. So for that reason, uh, this will be a slightly longer lecture, and I'm going to split it in two halves. The first one will be about what is it that led to the progressive movement, what is it that they were angry about, and then the next time around we'll focus on what is it that they changed, and they did do that a lot. Before we talk about the progressive agenda, let's think about what would be a progressive person today, or liberal, you might say. Well, generally that means that you believe the federal government, or the government in general, has a duty to fix ills in society. That is there such a thing as a income inequality or racial disparity? Well, then it is the job of the federal government to issue a law or create an agency to fix it. There's also a greater willingness uh, to indulge in income redistribution, uh, taxing the rich, especially through the graduated income tax, to give money uh, to the poor people through welfare programs. And in the modern version, there's a greater tendency to pay attention to things like uh, gender inequality, uh, racial disparities, or maybe even uh, transgender rights. Well, the progressives of uh, 1900, uh, they share many of these values, especially when it comes to the role of the government to fix the problems of society. And some other issues, especially race, uh, they are not quite as progressive as today. In fact, a lot of the progressives of the year 1900, like, say, Teddy Roosevelt or Woodrow Wilson, would be considered white supremacists today. So with that big caveat, uh, they are the ancestors of the modern-day liberals. Because the progressives, as I mentioned, are such an amorphous movement that spans several decades, two parties, different cities and states, it is kind of difficult to pinpoint a specific ideology. So to make things a bit easy for you, I split it into three main categories. Just be aware that I am oversimplifying things just for the sake of having bullet points and a nice PowerPoint. Those three issues that they do care about uh, would be restoring competition to American capitalism, two, to restore democracy that would be under threat, and three, to some extent, uh, to create a more socially just world. So let's examine all three issues turn by turn, because all three were in great trouble according to the progressives at the time. This era was the era of the Industrial Revolution, where you have a rapid upward thrust in American industry, which in many ways is great because America got richer and that's the ancestor of the modern day country that we live in that is quite rich. Uh, the problem though is that because you have unfettered competition, a kind of a dog-eat-dog -dog world, the more powerful corporations have a tendency to eat up the smaller ones. Uh, specifically in the late 19th century, every so many years you have a recession or even a depression. And when the economic times are tough, some of the weaker companies uh, go under and then are bought up by the richer companies. And if you go through several cycles of that, by the end you end up with very, very large companies. These would be called by the progressives uh, trusts. 
T R U S T. And the word trust has a positive connotation today, uh, but for the progressives, it's a bad thing. The trust are the big economic behemoths, the big guy that will crush the little guy. So pick whatever corporation you don't care for today, that's what they have in mind, a big conglomerate. A good example of that would be the corporation of John D. Rockefeller. He was from Ohio and he was very active in the oil business. He was a master of what became known as vertical and horizontal integration. Horizontal integration means you try to buy out all the various uh, competitors that you have doing the exact same business that you're doing. So let's say you are drilling for oil, you buy out all the oil drillers that are competing against you. Vertical integration, you mean that you want to control every stage of the process. So not only do you invest in uh, the exploration part of oil, uh, but also not just the drilling, but the exploitation aspect, and also maybe pipelines to have trans uh, transportation uh, to the refineries, and also refineries to transform your oil, and then a distribution system to bring oil all the way to the customers, you know, buying uh, gas stations and the like. And Rockefeller would do both, try to dominate the entire oil industry, every aspect of it, and every competitor. So what he created was the standard oil of New Jersey that was quite dominant in its time. You have a similar process going on in just about every industry, whether it's tobacco, railroads, or steel. The last time I mentioned Andrew Carnegie, uh, he would have been powerful in that particular sector. And early in the 1900s, you had the creation of U.S. Steel as part of the merger of various companies that were already pretty big. And when that new company that was uh, the result of that merger uh, first floated stocks on the U.S. stock market, the total capitalization of that company was north of $1 billion. And I know that $1 billion nowadays doesn't sound like much on Wall Street. You start up uh, some kind of a startup in your garage in California, and then five years later you go public and you capitalize it at $10 or $20 billion. But it's 1901. It's still the days when $1 billion, even in the world of finance, is a lot of money. And that created a lot of fears among the minds of progressives and so forth. How can you compete against those guys? If you're a small mom and corporation, or maybe a, a steel mill in Pittsburgh, how can you ever compete against such a huge economic behemoth as U.S. Steel? Especially since this is a time when uh, competition is rather cutthroat, and so people use uh, dirty deeds in order to defeat competition, not just because they make better products or sell them for cheaper, uh, but also because they use dastardly deeds. Uh, those captains of industry were often nicknamed by the progressives the robber barons. And so there's a very big distinction there between the way the conservatives that we studied earlier uh, view captains of industry as being remarkable people uh, who pulled themselves up by their own bootstraps, had a Horatio Algier story, and succeeded because they are superior or even uh, genetically superior. And the view by the progressives who think that the people who get rich are, are rich because uh, they were vicious people that crushed the competition. They stole the money. They are robber baron. Let me give you an example of one of the dirty tactics, and that's called dumping. Dumping means to sell goods below their cost. And you would think, why would any company do that? Why would you sell uh, a good that you produce for, I don't know, $1,000 a ton, if you're talking about steel, uh, for $500 a ton? You lose money for every ton of steel that you produce. Well, let's imagine that you are the boss of U.S. Steel and your capital reserves are huge. Remember, you're a billion-dollar corporation. Uh, you could sell steel below the production cost in the hope that this is going to drive your competition out of business because they have to match the prices that you're offering to the customer and they also have to sell their goods at a loss. And you can afford to do that for several years because you are U.S. Steel, the biggest corporation in America, but your competitors don't have the same cash reserves. And so after a few months of that, they'll be bleeding cash and they will go under. And then you can buy out their assets uh, for dimes on the dollar uh, and then gain some market share. And then now that you have established monopoly pricing power, you can set the price of the ton of steel at two or three thousand dollars a ton and you can recoup all the losses that you have made while dumping. So it's kind of an unfair way of using your strengths to drive out competition. Uh, in fact, nowadays, to sell below cost would be forbidden under a U.S. law uh, as a result of the progressive era. 
The progressives were often involved in journalism or writing books, and so their goal was to expose some of the evil wrongdoings of uh, some of those corporations. Uh, journalists in that case would be called muckrakers, in the sense that they would go and uh, go through the muck uh, to try to figure out all the terrible things that big corporations have done. Uh, in a way, these journalists would be the ancestors of investigative journalists nowadays uh, that try to expose the same kind of evils in American uh, society. Uh, muckrakers, like uh, if you have an expose on 60 Minutes, well, they have a hidden camera and they'll go to a butcher shop and tell you uh, how terrible the uh, health conditions are in this line of supermarkets. Or maybe the series by John Oliver, if you watch that on Sunday night on HBO. One of the more famous muckrakers of the uh, early 20th century was Upton Sinclair, and he's famous mostly for one book that is called The Jungle. And it's not exactly an article or a non-fiction work. Uh, he would be more of a novel, uh, but a novel that is in the realist school. Uh, Upton Sinclair was very inspired by a French novelist called Emile Zola, who wrote a series of novels describing French society in the 1850s uh, that were works of fiction, but that were supposed to be representative of the real world in which they, uh, they took place. And The Jungle is just like that. It's a realist novel, or naturalist novel is the other name of that school. So it follows a Lithuanian immigrant as he comes to America, hoping, because he's young and naive, that if you work hard enough and you're honest, you're going to do well. He eventually gravitates to Chicago, which is where the big meat packing yards were located. A lot of the cattle would be grown in the Midwest of the Great Plains, places like, I don't know, Kansas, Oklahoma, Colorado, and then would be driven by train to Chicago, which was and still is a major hub for uh, railroad tracks. And there they would be butchered and then uh, sent after that to the big city centers uh, of the east where the, the meat would be consumed after it had been canned. And uh, that's where that Lithuanian immigrant got a job in the jungle, except they quickly realized that the sanitary conditions were not quite good. And you have horrible stories in the book about uh, unsanitary practices, including putting rat meat into a canned food, or even human meat. One of the most famous, or rather infamous, passages in the book involves workers who fall into the vats where some of the meat is processed, and rather than waste that meat, management orders that everything be processed as canned meat anyway. So pretty disgusting if you read the, no uh, the novel when it comes out in 1906, and you know it's a work of fiction, but one that is supposed to be based on actual research, and you have cans of meat in your pantry, and you're thinking, is there human remains there? Or is it actual spam, uh, what it says on the label? And there's really no kind of uh, protection for customers uh, back then. It is very much a capitalist world uh, where buyer beware. So the uh, goal of Sinclair was to expose all of that, uh, and he did. It was a huge scandal when the jungle came out in 1906. And there's a general feeling that the economy has gone haywire by letting the strong eat the weak. Uh, you have a handful of robber barons that are abusing the public, uh, whether it's customers, all the workers that are not paying well enough, or uh, the competition uh, that they are underselling through dumping practices. A second sector that is in trouble, according to the progressives, would be American democracy. And that's a word that they like to employ, democracy. And that's again connected to various developments that you have in the late 19th century, such as a big surge in immigration. And many of the progressives were old stock Americans. Uh, they tended to be white. They often had ancestors that came on the Mayflower, so they were often of British and Dutch background, like, say, Teddy Roosevelt, for example. Whereas immigration that you have in the late 19th century comes more from Southern Europe and Eastern Europe. And you've all seen those pictures at Ellis Island where you see Italian immigrants showing up, also in the movie uh, The Godfather. Uh, those tended to be Catholic often, in case of people from, say, Poland or Italy or Ireland. Or they tended to be uh, Jewish if they came from Eastern Europe or Christian Orthodox if they came from Russia or, or Greece. And that was uh, problematic for people of British descent that would be more likely to be uh, Methodist or Presbyterian or Episcopalian. So there's a bit of a prejudice uh, involved in the way uh, all the progressives uh, would look at those new immigrants, that they are not quite ready uh, to become true American citizens. And yet they become quickly American citizens. The rules are pretty lax back then. So if you show up in New York City as a new immigrant, you don't speak the language, you're kind of lost in that huge city, you come from some small city in Southern Italy, 
Well, luckily, there's a local man who welcomes you on the dock after you come from Ellis Island, and he offers you a place to stay tonight, and maybe some money to tie you over, and a nice meal, and offers you a job as well. And if you're wondering why would the person help out immigrants that much, well, it's because at some point in the near future, that immigrant will become a citizen, and then they get to vote. And the day that they start voting, they will remember the nice man who helped them the first day that they were on the dock. This would be a political machine, as they were called. The most famous, or rather infamous of them, was Tammany Hall, the Democratic Party machine in New York City, uh, led by a man called Boss Tweed. Where do they get all the money to buy all these supporters? Well, if they do get elected as mayor of New York, then they get a chance to apportion public contracts. They are the ones that pick the company that will build that new tramway line and such. And so they'll pick a company based on a bribe, and you'll make millions in that matter, and you'll use some of that money uh, to buy more supporters in the next election. And you see how the system is self-sustaining. So very corrupt. Uh, it's not a, a normal way that democracy is supposed to, to function. So generally, there is a feeling that immigrants can't become true American citizens. And in that way, you could make some connections between the visions of immigration back in the late 19th century, at a time when you have high rates of immigration to the US, uh, to the same vision that there is today and where immigration, again, is on the front burner. And people in the US tend to be kind of mixed on the issue of immigration. Uh, everybody in America is an immigrant or a descendant of immigrant. Uh, even Native Americans, in a way, came uh, to the American continent something like 10 or 15,000 years ago. Uh, but everybody else would have come in the past two, three, four hundred years. Uh, so in a way, there's a sympathy toward immigrants because people know that, you know, your great grandpa came from Germany or something. Uh, on the other hand, every generation of Americans, after they become American, tend to look at the next generation as being somewhat unfit to be Americans. And that happens time and time again, that the early British Dutch settlers then looked at people coming from Germany or Ireland in the mid-19th century as being unfit to become U.S. citizens. That's when you have the no nothing party. And then that generation, when they get admitted, uh, by the period we're studying, around 1900, they look at people from Italy and Poland, Russia, as being unfit to become citizens. And then those people nowadays, or at least their descendants, uh, would look at people coming from Asia or Latin America as being somewhat unfit to be U.S. citizens. And I'm pretty sure at some point there will be Mexican-Americans 50 years from now looking at whatever immigrants we have in the U.S. 50 years from now and saying those people should not be U.S. citizens. Build that wall. The third problem that Progressive identified would be dealing with the way that society functions. One of these uh, famous muckrackers was named Jacob Rees, R-I-I-S. I assume he was of uh, Danish ancestry. That's a Danish name. And his own muckraking work was called How the Other Half Lives. And just look online and you'll be able to see some excerpts of that work. It's beautifully written. Uh, this was done based on actual uh, exploration that he did himself in some of the worst areas of New York City, uh, the immigrant areas, uh, the ghettos, the poor neighborhoods. And he would go into what would be called tenement houses. And a tenement uh, is like uh, uh, the projects today, uh, an apartment building catering to the poor, uh, built uh, by slum lords at the cheapest cost and then split into a tiny, tiny room where you would have an entire family with I don't know, five kids living in a single uh, small room. No running water, no good plumbing, no electricity. And so those areas would be uh, ripe with disease. You have outbreaks of uh, typhoid or what have you. Uh, really awful places. And that's the kind of place where the muckrakers who typically are progressive, meaning that they come from the 20 year areas of town, would never set foot. Well, Jacob Rees did. And then he reported uh, his findings to all his readers. It would be appalled that just a few miles away from where they lived in New York City, uh, people lived in such squalor. The way Rees described the poor in, uh, in his book, uh, rather sympathetic, uh, because he didn't say that these were undeserving poor. And remember from the lecture on the conservatives that the concept of the undeserving poor, which was quite prominent at that time, uh, argued that the poor deserved their fate, uh, that they were poor because they were lazy and they were drunk and they were not hardworking enough. Well, the way Reese described it in the other, ha other half lives uh, was quite different. Uh, he thought that they were poor because they had never received proper education, uh, because they had been crippled by disease and that disease was linked to their bad living conditions, or because there was some kind of depression going on and uh, nobody could find jobs and because the entire system was crooked against the working class. 
But you see that also uh, as well in Upton Sinclair's Jungle. Uh, the main hero, that Lithuanian immigrant, always trying to do what's good and never manages to get ahead uh, because there's always some crooked boss in his way or, or crooked uh, financial dealer that uh, robs him when he has a mortgage on his house and stuff like that. And in fact, the only way that the immigrant in the jungle ever makes good money is when he becomes a goon for the local party boss and is like hired muscle. So that's the one way you can get ahead in America uh, at that point is by doing a crooked deal. So there's something very unfair about that, that the upward social mobility doesn't work, and that's what Reese was arguing about. So these are the main issues that progressives identify. The economy is not a fair competing ground. You have some rich behemoths, the trusts, that are crushing competition and selling tainted meat to customers. Two, the political system is broken. American democracy does not work the way it should, in part because the voters are not always top rate, and even more importantly, because those big trusts are buying out access to Congress, and the US Senate is bought and paid for by the big trusts. And society is becoming unfair that you cannot get ahead as a poor person uh, because it's not a level playing field. Uh, many of these ideas, in a way, could be translated into the current environment, uh, where we still, in many ways, are facing the same problems of huge conglomerates, uh, parties that cater more to corporations uh, than uh, to uh, the interests of the public, and the sense that uh, the upward social mobility in America is broken. At least that's a sense on the left of the American political spectrum. Uh, so it's kind of interesting to study that period to see how different era of people face the same problems and what kind of solutions they would offer. Well, as far as the solutions, you'll have to wait a bit. That will be in the second half of the video. Au revoir and goodbye.